blue light and all that. Not just yeah. after dark, uh, privilege to be with you, young alumni from historically black colleges and universities having in-depth conversations about the institutions and the world surrounding them. Uh, for us today, frat brother Eric, uh, went to get him into school, uh, over on Instagram, Taylor the Ham, Tony Allen, and uh, now brother KD. So let's start with the obvious debate last night. Thoughts? Um, I think it's, it's, it's not actually at this point it got mentioned. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but do you think that that did anything to determine any kind of reasonable shift uh, in the election? Or we just we are where we're going to be on November third. Everybody shaking their hands. Winston, what you doing? Heavy side, dog. That's all you can say right now that that I had debate last night. But why? Why? Why are you signing? Because I think everybody has a different reason for that. I mean, it was weird because, like, on one end, it was possibly like the best. The it's the best debate that we've seen, like from Biden, right? It's the best, like overall effort. It's probably the clearest that we've heard of a lot of his platforms, which is kind of disheartening because it was the last debate. And then on the other end, it's just I think the most disheartening thing is like just knowing that. The only point that Trump had that was actually debatably factual was the HBCU point. Like, also, like that, that was probably the most disheartening part. Like, that's why I say like it's a heavy side because it's like we don't want to admit it, but dang, he he did bring that one out there. So but it's just interesting what we do after that. So the interesting part about that is I think I saw a, a, a tweet from uh Jamila Lemieux, who was saying every HBC president should decry him bringing up HBC fun <laughs> HBC funding. Um, there, there are inconsistencies about the the amount, you know, the permanency of it. Every politician lies about funding in some respect. Trump is lying, but it's it's support. It is legitimate support. Um, I'm tired of it being the the code HBCUs being the code for Black folks. Um, but do you think that that has any resonance, especially because we're we're in this period where more and more brothers are coming out saying the vote shouldn't be for sale or the vote shouldn't shouldn't come that easy? Um, d- d- especially when you think about how many rappers have come out, they don't have any particular ties to HBCUs. Ice Cube and Fifty Cent and Kanye, they don't have spectacular HBCU ties. I mean, does that make a difference, Taylor? For you? Repeat your last question, please. Does it make a difference, given that all the all the noise about black men being more selective in this in this uh, presidential election, and our vote being up for up for grabs? Do you think that the HBC you mentioned from last night or at any point has any resonance with black men or anybody who might be on the fence? No, um, I don't think. I don't think the comment from last night has anyone pushing anything because there is so much noise and there's just so much going on that I don't even know if that comment is resonating with anyone actually right now. Um, It's not, it's almost like, I feel like the comment is late, but it's like not late because the conversations to always be had, but the ways in which we're having them, there's so much distraction around it. Um, Especially when we want to bring in the celebrities who are opening their mouths, um, and speaking on behalf of the black community. I missed that meeting. I missed the email. I missed the text message because I just somehow forgot that we were having a meeting to even select our contracts. Um, so I I actually don't think um, that the comment about HBCUs is pushing anything. Um, it, feels, it feels afterthought to me, um, which most of this has been. Or as I never got to see now, you've been you've been destroying black men who've been saying I, I don't know who to choose or you know my vote is up for grabs. Do you stick with that point? Because I, I I never got the sense that the whole HBCU point really resonated with people. I feel like all four years, every time Trump said that, black folks, HBCU folks, kind of were like, man, please, like it it never it never moved the meter. You, and I, and perhaps maybe because he was such a racist outside of that context, but I don't think anybody other than the the president's ever said that means something. Am I am I wrong? 
Oh, you on mute? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I think I think I think part of the issue is that how about this? The people, the black men who are going to be moved by Trump aren't college graduates for the most part. They're also not HBCU graduates. They went to college at all, um, and it's. Oh, did you lose um, me again? There we go. Y'all keep losing me. All right, my yeah. bad. I just don't think that I don't think that it matters because I don't think black men who are thinking about Trump are even care about HBCUs. Those are people who say college doesn't matter. They want trades. They want those type of things. They're worried about those type of issues. They're worried about uh, you know money criminal reform. Like they're not worried about the things that that I think the HBCU community is. I think also um, HBCUs are very regional. Um, so if you live in California, if you live even in Illinois, uh, even in some Midwest states that have HBCUs, it's not as um, it's not as as ingrained in those cultures, I think, as it is in some of the East Coast and Southern states. So, um, like for instance, I don't, I don't think people I don't think people in New Jersey overwhelmingly are concerned about HBCU issues as much as they are in Maryland. But I mean, I think that in general. Uh, I just feel like it's 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 there's people are looking for an excuse to vote for Trump. Everyone wants to find their excuse if, if it's the if it's the crime bill, if it's HBCU, whatever it is. It's all based on lies. He lied all a lot. Of, he lied a lot last night. I mean, he even said Joe Biden called people pre- super predators. Like, come on, like just, just the fact that he was willing to just what can I dig up? Like whatever talking point I can come up with, I'm gonna say be it true or false. Anybody who is looking at that and says, oh, Trump did well, or even Biden did well, it's like, we can't even have a substantive conversation about facts. So it's really disheartening for me because it just shows you how stupid Americans really are. Like, we really are, <laughs> we really are comfortable with, with this level of ignorance. Like, it's, it's ignorant. Like, it really is like, ignorance. oh, he can say whatever. He can say, oh, he, you know, he thought Biden's brother. I mean, I didn't even hear someone mention Biden's brother. Like, I, first of all, he's 70. How old is his brother? His brother was 75. Right. I was like, when did, this, when did this happen? When did the brother get involved? I thought it was about Hunter <laughs> all the whole time. <laughs> Um, and then, then Eric, his laptop and emails. It was just, it was just bad. It was just bad. Eric, it, I, will, I will ask you this, and it actually ties to a um, uh, a segment that we're going to do a little bit about workforce development out of HBCUs. But Representative Mark Warner out of North Carolina wrote an op-ed in the Hill this week that said, you know, we ought to do a better job of tapping HBCUs to produce more legislative and elected officials and staffers. Um, because we can't, you can't address these issues and you can't address these inequities until you get an infrastructure that's influenced by us. So to the point that you've seen, you know, you got a, you got a white man from North Carolina saying we got to get more diverse in congressional ranks. You have more and more people of color running for and winning elected office at local and federal levels. Do you think that Trump accelerates and we, there's some there's some proof that or some evidence that suggests he has already from the 2018 midterm. But do you think either his exit or his retention will accelerate the number of black folks getting involved in politics? And does that bode well for HBCUs in terms of HBCU graduates getting involved? And if so, how much of a platform should black colleges be in terms of their their political uh, their political campaigns or, or their campaigning to reach people? The unfortunate thing is that over the last four years, what I what I truthfully seen is not necessarily just more black people being involved with politics, but I'm seeing more black people being involved in scam politics. I mean, if you will, um, I think I've seen more of a boom or a resurgence, if you will, of outwardly politically black conservatives over the last four years than I have seen anything necessarily changing on a liberal progressive end. Um, and to that point, I mean, they're, they're, so it may be an increase, but we have to see where the increase is at, right? Um, if you have more black people being involved with politics, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we we do need people on both sides of the aisles. Um, I don't necessarily, I, I don't necessarily like the fact that, you know, it's pr- primarily two parties, um, but we do need more people involved in general. What I will say is that that op-ed is a, great standpoint, but as somebody who's uh, worked to um, 
showing more uh, HBCU students the actual political process up front, bringing students to Capitol Hill uh, with HBCU Collective, like we've done over the last handful of years, it's very hard for it, it, the entire way of just getting people involved with politics to even become staffers. The amount of money that it takes for somebody to become a staffer, which is largely an unpaid position <laughs> um, to, while living in Washington, D.C., which is one of the top five you know, most expensive uh, metropolitan areas in the country to live within, it doesn't really, we can want to have more of us in those situations that we want to, and we should, but we got to be more realistic about what that looks like. If you're not going after these people on a political level while they're still in colleges in regional areas, then getting them up to the hill doesn't necessarily make the most sense. And then beyond that, if you, if you really care, like, it, like, do you really want them there to, to make it look like you're doing more as far as making it more diverse? Or do you want them there to actually have influence? Because you can have a bunch of black staffers all you want to, but just like Trump used the president as a photo op, those staffers can be used as a photo op too. It doesn't mean they're actually doing anything to really change where we're going. Let's talk about that real quick, like how you change over strategy. So Una, I think, is our, our official pro, uh, protest correspondent for Dodgers at the Dark. Um, once election season arrives, and as many you know demonstrations and things that you you've been a part of, do you see a lot of the people that came out for like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor? Do you see that transitioning over to um, activity to influence policy? And let's just let's just take it from New York, from a, from a New York perspective. Do you see um, all people, not just black folks, saying, "Okay, we were doing this for unjust murders and and and, and homicides by police and all that." Now let's have a conversation about policy, or do we have to be activated by something that's just blatantly unjust, and and that's what'll take it to the streets? I mean, I think that we we are activated, um, and then we start remembering all the other stuff that we didn't um, speak on, or that we didn't get the um, we didn't get justice. So we, when we go out there, it's definitely about what currently happen but it's also about those things that hey we still don't know what's going on with with the um Breonna Taylor like there's still stuff out there that we're we're trying to understand and find out we know it's been hidden from us so i don't think it's necessarily policy that will change but the fact that that we are seeing in our in our neighborhoods in our communities that we're not getting just treatment um policy i mean we were protesting when obama was president that it didn't mm -hmm. it didn't matter Katie, have you seen more act activity in in your community? Um, not necessarily about HBCUs, but have you seen more people who typically aren't aren't politically engaged or just not dialed in on a regular basis? Have you seen more activity from them leading up to this election? Yeah, um, Ali is more to rebut Joe Biden than it is to be anti forty five. And my thing is that's fine with me because I do believe that politics should start on a grassroots level. So if we want to talk about involving more people in politics in general, let's do it on the local level first. Let's not <clears throat> chase these federal seats so much because a lot of, and that's the thing I think everybody misses, not everybody, but most people who are not adept to the political process miss about politics is that a lot of the change that happens, happens on the local level. So focus more on your mayors, on your councilmen, on your district leaders than you do that senator and the president and the, and the, and the people that's going to the house because Yes, every election has consequences, but the most consequences come from the people that are on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I do see a lot of people being active, just, you know, using their voice. I don't know if that's going to equate to voting, though. And so that's the other trick is, are you doing things to get people out to vote or are you just being an antagonist for the sake of being an antagonist? Uh, and I can't tell the difference. There's no data to show, you know, who's going to do what. Come what they said, no. Right. Especially if you factor in the fact that I live in Maryland. Well, we live in Maryland. Um, me and you, Jared, sorry. <laughs> What's the state we do state? So you being pro-Trump doesn't matter because nobody, for the most part, he's going to win Maryland by like 30 or 40 points on the low end. Larry Hogan just scoffed at that. Winston, we will give you the, <laughs> we'll give you the last word, bro, because you are in a swing state. Um what do you think? Like, obviously, Detroit is a place where it's like you, you can probably you can probably 
look ahead and say, okay, this part of, of Michigan will vote a certain way. But what do you think it's going to take for so many people who are undecided, so many of these counties that are evenly split? What do you think it's going to take pressurize, and I mean like social media or black folks in some method of communication to get folks activated and saying, here's what you got to do to turn this thing around or make it go a different direction. There's only five of y'all, Ohio, Michigan, what, North Carolina, Florida, uh, what's the other one, Pennsylvania? No, that's your, that's your election right there. So you're sitting in the middle of one of them. So what are you, what are you doing or what are you seeing that's, that's engaging people to take, take seriously their role in this? Well, unfortunately, like to, to Eric's point, there's a lot of people who are who are, I think doing it in a negative way and kind of like just propaganda and just what they hear off of Twitter and the Internet. And it's interesting to watch and see people who were kind of disengaged previously in this process. All of a sudden, you are, you an expert because you read some uh, some social media posts and you you spewing things that don't have any real legitimacy behind them, kind of similar to 45 um, in general. Um so, you know, that's kind of problematic as a whole here. I think to KD's point, what it will take in a swing state like Michigan like here is like people need to be involved. It's got to be a grassroots effort and you got to be in those spaces and places um, that were largely not really charged up prior to President Obama being in office. You know, there's a lot of folks around here. It's the first time I ever had to wait in line to vote ever when Barack Obama's first um, first. Usually when we're going midterm election and other things like I can walk right in, walk right out. I don't have any problems. Um, as far as that goes. But so those same people kind of been disengaged ever since President Obama left. And it's going to it's got to be a grassroots effort. And we on the clock. I mean, it's you know, we gonna be voting. Some folks have already a lot of folks. What I thought was interesting last um, uh, watching the debate was people were um, already like my, my votes already in. He's lucky. Like I saw like three or four tweets like he's lucky my votes already in Biden because this ain't really giving me anything. It's not really giving me a whole lot to go off of or really be. Um, encouraged or enthused by. So in general, folks, I mean, it's kind of late, but if we're going to say to make sure that we handle business in Michigan, it's got to be a grassroots effort. It's got to be people on the ground educating those communities and areas where folks are not normally involved in the process or don't really see a value or necessity to be involved in the process, really, um, and just helping them understand that. I mean, from my perspective, working in youth development, you know, I got a lot of first time voters who we are trying to make sure understand. I had to battle with my mentee going, calling back and forth, texting like you don't understand how imperative it is for you to be involved and engaged in this process. We can't you can't just sit on the sideline and then complain about nothing being done on the east side of Detroit because, you know, they don't really care. But you're not giving them any effort or put putting any fuel to the fire to make them want to care about the things that matter to you. So. It's got to be grassroots. It's got to be people who are on the ground already who are willing to get engaged and involved and help engage and involve other people in that space. Every vote counts, man. And, and one thing about this this pandemic, this, you know, well, there's no good time for a virus outbreak. But to have that in the middle of a, of a consequential election like this, where HBCUs typically would have been hosting these candidates, would have been hosting these um, these town halls and these debates, and the young people would have been out there registering people to vote. Um, and, and, and some of the, the campuses that are open, they're still marching through the streets and marching to the polls and all that. But how much, how much activity are we missing? Because a lot of these campuses are not open and you're not seeing HBCU students flooding the streets. Like that's, that's what we do, vote. And so you have a major, major body of activity that's just not there because of the virus. So. You know, so be help. encouraged, though. Be encouraged. Um, 50, I'm, I'm trying, man, because I think they're doing their thing with social media and all that, but it's it's just not it's not the same vibe. It's not the same as seeing a sea of Texas Southern students True. walking, you know, walking to the polls. But even with all the voter suppression, it, it's nothing like that. Southern states, like but, but, all the voter suppression, but, 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 Texas may flip. Yeah, in Texas, he's actually Biden is polling ahead. <laughs> yeah, Texas. I mean, I, I, I don't live here, and I've seen it. I've seen it in, in, in Houston, and I'm in Harris County. And, and to that point, and even over well, there, I, 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 I voted for you. <laughs> That's I'm true. But to this point, right though, right right. but to this point, more people have voted already <laughs> in Texas than voted for Trump the last time. True. So again, just yeah. have hope. Have hope. Have hope. Let's take. Well, listen. If 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 if, if Texas goes blue. Whatever number he wins by, y'all might want to write down a lot of the next day. <laughs> let's, let's take the, um, the, the note on the coronavirus and spin this forward. So we've been talking regularly since the outbreak about what the outcomes would be for HBCUs. And it was just a couple of weeks ago 
where people were saying, oh, you know, HBCUs are doing well. They they're they're managing this thing. People are not getting sick. It seems like we got the we got the we got the keys. A week later, <laughs> now you're seeing campuses with, with increased numbers. Florida Memorial is 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 up. Uh, people are losing jobs. Uh, you're seeing you're, you're seeing a number of campuses reporting uh, increases. North Carolina a t which was part of the highlight package of saying how good we're doing, dozens of cases over a week. And so that whole Labor Day, um, get together and let's go stand around outside of the cookout. Now we're starting to see the results of that. The country's going up on cases. HBCUs are going up on cases. Uh, and I will start with Una and Tay because Hampton University I believe, I believe is the first HBCU to have announced as of this week, uh, the first that will will go all virtual for the spring semester. So Taylor, you had some interesting comments about the reaction of alumni. And I think this has to get, this has to get out there because I think that this, this, this shows what coronavirus fatigue is really all about. So tell, tell, tell us what you shared in your group with the Hampton alumni once that announcement was made. Um, so, you know, it warms my heart to hear that it is still virtual. Um, I'm just someone that doesn't believe that students and folks need to be on campus during this time, um, even though as much as I would want them to. And yes, traditions may be lost and experiences may look different. And of course, we always want everybody, you know, to have what we have historically seen as a traditional college experience. But I am all for us being safe and healthy. Um, over just having people being on campus in spaces, especially on campuses where um, you can't necessarily control in some ways. And so Hampton announced that aid will be virtual. Um, and of course, most folks, majority of people were like, you know, supportive of it. Of course, you can always have the grief of wanting um, to have students on campus to experience a similar experience that many of us Hamptonians have experienced. Um, and for me, it was hard to see that some of my alums, you know, were upset about the decision, um, feeling that we were stripping students of their first year and freshman experience, you know, not being able to stay in their dorm, um, never going to have the opportunity to sit in um, as a Twitchell trendsetter or, you know, to be James Hall, you know, one of the ghetto boys, Harkness Hall, HH Too Smooth, and, you know, all of these things. Some folks were making comments about, like, how are they going to be real Hamptonians? And I struggled with that because what does that mean if the Hampton experience is only commodified by, of course, the dorm you live in, um, the dorm step show, which was gone by the time I got there in Hampton. So am I a true Hamptonian or not? So it's like it started for me to challenge the notion of what is this process and processes and performances and for some folks, hazing experience for folks to have a true HBC experience. And so I was struggling because some people were getting rid of the safety of our students, faculty and staff members, because they felt that the true Hampton experience is no longer going to be offered. And it's like, because the student can't live in a dorm during a pandemic, or they can't experience a spring fest in person. And I struggled with that, because I was like, all of this is happening during a pandemic. And so what does it mean to be a true Hamptonian? What does it mean to be a true, like, Aristo or family? Like, if we can't physically be here, are we no longer family? Are we no longer supporting each other? What does that mean? And that scares me when I have when I see that there are alums who might possibly treat students who didn't have a first-year experience at Hampton differently because they're not a real Hamptonian because they didn't stay in the dorm. Una, are you going to shade um, Hamptonians who are virtual this year? Nah, because I'm teaching them. <laughs> Absolutely not. But I also understand as um, one who has worked in res life, the the bonds that are built. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's major. Like if ever a parent asks, you know, should I, should my child stay on the yard? My answer is always yes. Always. Because there's learning that goes on beyond the classroom. So I, I kind of feel bad for them because how do we substitute? that right what does that look like and if we don't um are they getting the enriched experience that is an hbcu we haven't quite figured that out yet 
do you think that that changes it? So let me let me throw this to Oars because you you went to FAMU, um, residence life at at Florida A M is is up there is good. People would res respect that that yard. Um, obviously, you miss learning opportunities. Obviously, you miss social development opportunities. But is that do you think it's that critical to any college experience? And is it that critical to the HBCU experience? Because from what Taylor is saying, it's almost like you missed the whole thing. Like it, because of this pandemic and y'all so scared, you've missed the whole meaning of what an HBCU is. Is that true? I would say no, because at least for me, the pillar of HBCU experience was the classroom experience, which mm -hmm. is still a black experience. Um, I did live in uh, those things they call dorms at FAM. Um, and the kids now, I mean, right now we're actually FAMU's homecoming week, and it's my 10 year from my freshman year. Um, and obviously we don't have to, so we're doing this virtual stuff. People talk about how you know, the new dorms the kids have, they have cable, they have singles, um, they have their own bathrooms, and they're saying that these kids aren't the same. And they have, again, just different newer facilities based on, you know, the prison style facilities we, we, we lived in. <laughs> um, so, but, but, but all jokes aside, I, I don't think it is. I think that in general, you do make more bonds living on campus. You do make more relationships. Um, but in some ways, virtually, you do have the opportunity um, to focus more on your education, focus more on um, kind of those interactions in the classroom. And I think that can be just as beneficial. But um, just because we're virtual for now, won't be virtual forever. People will still go back. They'll still create bonds. We're still going to pledge. We're still going to join. I mean, all things are going to happen. <laughs> so I, I think that I think I think that people putting, back. I've been saying the virtual line. First of all, I want to ask this because some of y'all like, agree. How do you? How does somebody <laughs> get online through COVID? What you just ask know. us? Oh God! I've seen. What did we just ask? Three, I've seen three. Yeah, yeah. I've seen. I've seen yeah. Three yeah. I heard it. Uh, what did he just say? Help! Help! What's got to come out? He said, "How you have a line for COVID?" <laughs> well, so I repeat. <laughs> but you want to hear that from me, though. That wasn't on today's subject topic line that I like emailed from Gary Carter. <laughs> I had to cut my camera off. I don't even know that wasn't on. That was not on today's like list. So I don't. Well, let me this, and I'm glad, I'm glad Lauren joined it because uh, a lot of at, the, at fairly or unfairly, the conversation starts with with A and T um, because they were one of the schools that were highlighted as they're handling this well. Um, and they had to because North Carolina forces them to, to open, be open um, and to deal with COVID-19. Um, but to see the numbers going up, Laurel, and the school isn't saying, all right, we're going virtual. Um, they're saying, all right, we've had a cluster in this dorm. We've had a cluster on the men's basketball team. We've had a cluster on the football team and in the marching band. OK, moving on. Is that is that ideal for a and or is it? Do you wish they would go in a different direction with it? I mean, I think, you know, granted, it's been years since I've been on campus. So who knows how that Internet is this decade. But I would hope that I mean, I know all schools right now are, are starting to come out with their plans for spring semester. So I would hope that they would recalibrate and reconsider, um, especially since virtual homecoming is starting in a couple of days. So, I mean, I think. Granted, with the UNC system, I have no idea what Chapel Hill and the rest are uh, doing right now. But I feel like for A&T to at least as much as they can do within that, um, talking to parents, uh, I mean, they don't have the capacity. They don't have a hospital on campus. They're not Howard. So I feel like, especially at the end of the semester, seeing what the numbers look like around finals time, I think they're going to need to put their foot down and just say, you know, it's not safe. And whatever hits they get financially, you're just going to have to eat it. Because it's like, do you want to owe money or do you want multiple lawsuits and body? I also think it's a time to reimagine what, again, and I'm going to keep saying it, every meeting that I've been in, um, no matter what, nothing we've ever done in this life is going to be 
pre-pandemic after this. And so I think we even need to start reimagining how we view our school calendars, how we view just experience in general. Um, I think it was really dope that in the letter that was sent to families that President Harvey said, like, you know, when I spoke with students, they were like, hey, can we get some wellness breaks next semester? Because we tried it out this first semester and we noticed that like, yeah, we aren't having all of these extra breaks, but like we need it mentally because we're doing so much. Um, can we move to asynchronous because some of us on the West Coast and getting up for this class is not working. And so that is what I see is like us moving into reimagining how we're trying to reimagine, you know, homecoming experience, you know, post pandemic. Are we still going to offer a virtual opportunity to still engage alums who cannot be here physically? So what are we going to start doing now post pandemic when it comes and how are we reimagining our experiences and reimagining our learning, reimagining, you know, maybe how we were doing this, we, sh we can rethink and we can actually do because we were forced at hand to do it. So how can we now incorporate it and be even more intentional once we do come out of this? Because we will because as Black folks, we do, and we will, and always shall overcome. Don't none of y'all start singing. But <laughs> I just think it draws and like how, you know, Laurel said to, to come back together to think about, all right, just in shake this first semester, what can we do? Um, that's what I hope and ask for all of us who are in the higher ed landscape and just even as HBCUs and as alums, like, and all of we're doing, um, virtual has offered new ways of thinking, and I hope and pray that it stays as we move into our physical lives coming back together. Well, hey, that, about and, it. And you bring up an interesting point because I think one of the one of the things that a lot of schools try to do to to mitigate this is to say, okay, we will go home before Thanksgiving, um, and so that way, as the, the months get colder and the virus gets more uh, more harmful or more easy to spread, we'll we won't. We won't be around. You won't be here. But guess what? You're going to be at home and you're going to be doing you're going to be with family for Thanksgiving. You probably will be with family for Christmas. Winston, in terms of the students that you're talking to and that they're going to campuses where they got to go back in the spring. Do you think that there's a concern, not that they're, they're coming home with COVID, but that they'll catch it at home and then bring it back to the school? That's a good point. I don't um, I think largely the conversation is, is still centered around them bringing it home but that's i mean you bringing it back to school is a whole nother damn it i'm curious to see um how it goes like we do hampton is the only official i think that we have uh, up to this point but i'm you know it's still early it's still very early um for other schools to uh kind of change course as well so i'm curious to see how it goes um it takes it takes one school typically to start kind of leading the charge to have people thinking differently um, maybe Hampton is that school in this instance, like kind of how they were to, in the in the fall um, and folks kind of to see that the value or um, the concerns that might be legitimate for people coming back to campus. Um, I think it, at the end of the day, what we know it often boils down to is, is the dollar. You know what I mean? How what to Laurel's point, what kind of hit are you going to take and are you willing to bite that bullet um, in order to to help, you know, not have catastrophic uh, you know issues that, that can arise from it? Um I know in general, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm hoping that there's more people like Taylor's at the table. I don't know how optimistic I am that that's the case, that people understand that you're going to have to reimagine and reinvent these things. Um, and even towards the point that it's going to look, we're going to come out of it. At some point, we're going to be on the other side of this and how we start moving in the direction to make that work. And I think to, to Taylor's point, it's really got to be how we can reimagine, re rebrand and re talk about the HBCU option as a valuable option for a young person that's not centered around everything happening in the yard or in large groups or what have you, but these other value systems and other value, like Or said, the classroom instead of classroom, a rich black experience with a with a professor that looks like you and other people that look like you is still valuable. And how we package and talk about that going forward, I think is going to be pivotal. I mean, and that, that should be starting now. Those conversations and that um, and that positioning should start right now, um, regardless to whether or not everybody's back on a campus in the spring or not. And, and we need to start having these conversations um, with the value of our schools and, and why they're valuable and the new ways we can reimagine positioning that to the masses. Katie, do you think that people at this point of the virus, do you think that they're taking it seriously to the point that when it first started, we were still standing around in groups. We were doing all that um, and we were doing OK. Because I think that we just don't we don't have 
frat houses and all that other stuff where a whole a hundreds of people can can gather indoors. But do you think that with all the, the common black sense folks have applied over the course of this virus, do you think that that they're still sensible about it? And in the winter months with Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and all that, that we will apply that during those times where we're normally getting together? Um, uh, there's two sides to this. Uh, some of us, yes. Some of us um, have just grown fatigued, right? And so we miss traveling. We miss our friends. We miss our family. Uh, and so we're taking risks that you probably shouldn't, but you really can't blame them because you're just tired of sitting in the house and sitting around, especially for those of us who have a little bit of resource and can afford a rental car or afford a plane ticket while they're cheap. Definitely taking a risk that I, I couldn't do in my household and my wife and, and that is with child. I refuse to take a risk like that. Um, so do I think as common sense is being applied, some of us, those of us that have been educated enough to know that this pandemic is very much real. Those of us who are around medical professionals who are stressed out, um, friends and family that I know personally working, still working 10, 12 hours a day, four or five days a week. If you see that and it affects you in that way, you're taking it seriously. But some of us are just you know, so fatigued and really don't believe anything that they hear, especially because you got a federal government who's lied to you since January 1 when this thing, when we should have been alerted. And it's lied to us since March and then doubled down on the lies and then lied again last night on that debate stage. I mean, I just posted a share the, um, the statistics last week about how the hardest hit areas are definitely in them red states. And whether people like to hear it or not, those are the states that didn't take it seriously Enough listening to the 45th president of the United States, and now they're getting ravaged. And if Maryland struggled without abundance of resources, Johns Hopkins University of Maryland, New York struggled, and their abundance of resources and their fantastic medical system. I know Idaho, Iowa, Wisconsin <laughs> <laughs> do not have those those stellar medical institutions to speak of are struggling. It was like when I watched the news report, um, one time only had a hospital with 10 beds. Right. It's like you got a lot of rural areas like that. They had literally one medical center for a hundred miles. Right. They're struggling. So, uh, you know, I, I'm praying that Thanksgiving doesn't cause the next spike because there's a spike right now. Thank you, flu. <laughs> that flu cocktail mix that we've been warning people about. Um, I'm sorry, that flu COVID cocktail mix that we've been warning people about since June. It's happening. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope we hope and pray that we don't lose another 200,000 people. But, you know, like uh, Van Jones said, who, you know, we all have gripes at this point. But he said it's a it's literally a 9-11 every week. Eric, I'll leave the last word on this one to you. Do you think that institutions can keep yo-yoing like this? Meaning there was the benefit of particularly for HBCUs. OK, we you know, the federal government is going to send a whole bunch of PPE and a whole bunch of money to address this. At some point, those resources are going to run out. At some point, schools are going to have to stop this, this game of start, stop. OK, we're going to have students. Now we're not. All right. We, we're not going to have them. Then we're going to have them. You can't keep yo-yoing as an organization like that. How much, you know, working at institution, how much do you think that that's sustainable where you can change your mind midstream? And it's interesting about Hampton because remember, Hampton said, we're coming back. And then like a week later said, no, nah, never mind. Right before the semester started, Morgan did the same thing. So, do you think it can sustain with that back and forth, like make, not making up my mind or kind of play how this goes, or you know, is that is that workable? I think it's interesting. It's very interesting. Am I still on mute? There you go. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting, and I'm going to like to a degree lean on Taylor's point because she made a really good one. Um, I do think it's interesting that Hampton is the one that's at least somewhat being first in this because Hampton, if I'm not mistaken, has the longest tenured president of any HBCU currently. Um, and it kind of highlights this issue of leadership of HBCUs because at some point, you know, the yo-yoing, it, it comes down from the top, right? Oh, we're going to do one thing or we're going to do something else. And I'm waiting for which school? I can't say because I, I don't know which one it will be. I'm waiting for leadership from some institution to say, not only are we going to remain 
remote until it is truthfully safe for our students to get, to return back to campus at full capacity, but also utilize COVID as an opportunity to literally thrust the institution into the future. There are, I mean, you're talking about possibilities of we're going to be home by Thanksgiving. So what happens if you decide, if a school decides to say, oh yeah, we're now going to move our semesters up so that they, they start in early August, they end Thanksgiving. Oh, now we may be able to have a winter semester, which can benefit our students in the long run. It may cost more money, but it may give us more money. Uh, which, which of our campuses are making sure that they're building infrastructure on their campuses to make sure that, you know, professors can easily go into their classroom, record live sessions, offer these courses online, opening up how many students can now be educated in in the, in the aspect of an HBCU education. So even if a student can't physically be there, they can get the HBCU education, which now brings more money into our schools. How many how many of our schools are going to make the decisions where we take this opportunity to like really thrust ourselves and to bring ourselves to the forefront and get rid of some of these <laughs> old black and green uh, chalkboards in our classrooms, re, like rechannel re our money on our campuses to make our, our institutions better, more competitive, um, more accessible. Uh, there's so many things that we can actually do. And it's interesting because when we have this trend of HBCUs where most of our, most of our schools can't keep a president beyond five, five years, uh, we've seen two institutions most recently who literally for no reason other than the board trying to move its weight around, removing presidents, having to bring presidents back when they were doing a good job. Shout out to Lincoln <laughs> and, and, and Jamie and, and right. uh, Texas Southern. Right. Right? Like, all these things that our schools could really be doing to make themselves better institutions and bring in more black students who want to go to our, our schools, we could be doing right now. They could be reallocating a lot of the money that, you know, schools are trying to force having a, a non-revenue generating football season or basketball season to do into our actual classrooms, which our main purpose is to educate people. Oh, no, you got doing- football going up in the spring, bro. Oh, oh, is it? Is it going to make you more money than it would have made? And, now, if it would and now, it's, now that actually makes no sense because most of the major uh, conferences are playing. And so now... Right. So everybody... <laughs> oh, in the money game. Like, move it to the spring, which was sensible. I'm not blaming HBCU; that was fine. But now everybody, all that guaranteed money, you thought you were gonna get in the spring? That's playing now. What they, what they gonna do? They gonna play, they gonna play us for their spring for their spring game? <laughs> we gonna, get, we gonna, get, we gonna get paid for their spring game? But I'm saying like the a lot of the, one of the main one of the issues with a lot of HBCUs and why Paul Quinn looks as good as it does is because they dare to do something that has never been done to do something that has never been done, right? Most of our institutions will refuse to do things that have, they, they will do the things that they've always done and then expect things to suddenly change. And it's literally insanity. And if we don't take advantage of this opportunity to now shift how we've been operating our schools, then when we come out of it, we may be worse, over, we may be worse overall when we yeah. could have been better. Let's uh let's stay on the topic of money. We're gonna we're gonna cut and, and go to our final topic um because we ran a little bit over on that one. Um Morehouse, Spellman, Howard, uh twelve million dollars from Morgan Stanley, ho hum. Um at this point, this is every week you can set your watch to millions coming to 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 Morgan. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, Morehouse, Spellman, Howard, which is a good thing. Um, but I'm not going to engage in a conversation about why did the elite HBCUs get all the money. Let's talk about what we're missing. So Fort Valley State also this week uh, announced a, a $1.1 million gift from Chevron to support their energy program. Southern University has had uh, donations from Dow, Chevron. So you're, you're, you're t- and, and I guess to the tune of $5 million or so over the last two weeks. So everybody complained over the summer about how would more of Spelman get all the money? But when other HBCUs get the money, nobody talks about it. We talked about that with Lemoyne Owen, forty million dollars. Nobody said a word about it. We talked about that with, um, uh, and, and it's escaping me. But other school, A and T, got money. Nobody really said anything about it. So it's almost like where where do we end this catch twenty two? Because it's money. It seems like it's money coming from everywhere. It may not be to the point of one hundred sixty million dollars, 
But there's money coming, substantial funds. So at, at what point do we say, all right, we had it wrong. HBCUs are, are, are doing, are doing, now I won't say pretty well, but doing better than we've done in the past. Because a lot of different schools of a lot of different sizes are getting some substantial gifts that are going to make a serious difference. So I, you know, Laura, we'll start with you. Did, yeah. Is it yeah. is this an information issue? Like we just don't have the information or are we just stupid and, and just love to be stuck on the headline? Howard Morehouse Spellman get all the money. The answer is B, all of the above. <laughs> I, think. I think often just with anything, especially if you can look at activism, we only pay attention to people who are the most visible, already visible, already on the channels. We're already checking if you use Twitter and people misunderstand that the whole world isn't on Twitter. All your aunties and uncles and grandmas are on Facebook. And then you got everyone else that's just still reading the newspaper. And so I think it's an issue, one, on the school's end of not having adequate comprehensive communication and marketing strategy, um, even not just with donations, but even with programs they already have. Like I always mention to people how South Carolina State has like a nuclear, it's like a nuclear engineering program funded by the Department of Energy. And they've had it for at least 10 years. And nobody knows about it, really. Mm. And so, and I'm sure other schools have things like that where they're not even just grant regular grant programs, but they're funded by the government. And nobody knows about it unless you are just on it that much at 19 or 18 and you want to do nuclear engineering and you happen to find out because you care. But the average student is not like that. They're going to look for the amenities. They're going to start with homecoming. What? what's near the closest big city and all those other things. Maybe they might care about a certain faculty member if whatever um, they're looking at. But I think between stuff like programs of study or just where the money is going, even if the school is getting all this money, is it going to be put into play next semester? Is it going to be put into play two years from now? Is it going to get tied up in an audit? So that's also my question too. Like, is this just part of the overall, like, oh, we care about black people now, here, here's a check. Because it looks good for me. We've already seen that philanthropy is part of big business and it's a way for people to not pay taxes. Um, and so I just feel like, I feel like this is an opportunity for schools to like, we'll take advantage of it while it's coming, but also don't get comfortable. And then to actually use the money, don't just say, okay, you got, I don't want to name drop Howard, but I'm going to do it anyway. Howard has gotten all this money. And so I know last week they just sent out a whole bunch of messaging about all the infrastructure updates they've been doing, which people have been asking about. So I was like, okay, great. Because a lot of people were asking the right questions. And I was like, well, I work there and I got nothing. So I think now it's finally starting to come out, but with all the stuff that they've gotten this year, you know, I hope that they're as transparent as possible with what they're going to do with that money and the process and things like that. Because I think, especially now because of COVID and how we've all had to readjust, um, I think it's more imperative that all institutions be as transparent as possible because schools are in dire straits and people are not in a position to keep dropping all this money. And you can't even tell me where my, where the money you expect me to still pay, even though I'm not on campus and I don't know where it's going. Katie, do you think that these gifts will inspire and I want to make sure I choose the right word. Um, I guess folks who aren't rich to, to adopt a more um, philanthropic approach to HBCUs. Like, in other words, will it will it have like a trickle down effect of, <laughs> to make people to make people say, "Wow, you know, all these companies are giving. Maybe I should give." Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> HBCU alumni are stingy with their own with my, their money. Towards the institution, a lot of HBCUs have HBCU alum have disdain towards the institution. So I absolutely don't think this is going to charge anybody to spend money. I'm an avid. I support Coppin. Flag behind me. All day. I'm life man. I'm proud of that. That changed my life. Right. If you if if Coppin didn't do that for you, or if your HBCU didn't do for you what it did for me, you're not as um, likely to support. Uh, and so, like Laurel said, we need marketing. If you could just market the things that you're good at, I think it would attract the donors that you need to attract. And part of that is just really, we need to build relationships with our communities first before we start asking for money. And we're poor at that in some, in some regards. Um, 
I think Coppin and Morgan are better at it because they buy property around their institutions like it's uh, like it's a um, uh, goddamn auction. But, um, <laughs> a lot of institutions don't think like that. If, if it is a possibility for them, it's just like build it, build from within first, and then say, "Hey, this is what we're doing. This is where we need support." Tell me where you need support. I don't know. And that's probably why you're not getting money. Let's so, talk about that. Let's talk about that because you just hit something, and and Laurel hit on it too. A lot of times there's this impression that you see million dollar gifts coming to these schools. And that means, oh, Howard got it now. Howard got money. They don't. They don't. <laughs> That's what getting Howard out of years of deficits on deferred maintenance and going to scholarships to keep students from, from dropping out of school and trying to get faculty members raises that have been years overdue and staff raises. Faculty. Raises. Trying to trying to get uh, benefit packages more competitive. Raises. Laurel shaking her head and she didn't get a raise. Um, sure did it. Sure did it. <laughs> but yeah. do, do you raises. think that there's an education necessary? Um, Taylor, I'll give this to you. Do you think that there's an education necessary from the HBCUs to alumni and students to say, "Yeah, we got a bunch of money, but guess what?" And I and I and I and I tell you why I asked this because I did an interview with Moore House President David Thomas when I asked him the question: Is it fair that you get criticized? for this. And the first thing out of his mouth was, it costs $5 million a month to run Morehouse College. And even to me- You know, I really feel that one, that HBCUs um, should require in a university run on ones, like what is like higher ed and how, what, how to run an uh, institution and all of those things. One, I think it's important to even just use higher ed in a university one-on-one, a freshman intro course, because you can teach all the things that students want to learn. You can create a PR project, um, create a PR um, like kit for your institution. You can create an engineering program, you know, develop all these things. But even for alums, I think it's important that in alumni associations to create um, webinars about what does it mean to run an institution? What does it mean to do all of these things? Because oftentimes folks see that money has been thrown and institutions are fine. Or they hear about a partnership like with um, F F FBSU um, in regards to like Chevron, like we should have been having this in the past when they've had this since 1983. They've been having this since, that's 30 years. I ain't even been here for 30 years yet. So it's like it's been here and oftentimes, you know, folks are like, y'all aren't doing anything. And so it's like a catch 22 because it's like, again, with transparency, it doesn't always mean to be transparent about negative things. It also needs to be transparent about, you know, the great things that are happening as well. But there are so many things that go into this staff turnover rates, faculty, loss of institutional knowledge, folks losing departments, things happening. And so sometimes good things get lost up and sometimes bad things get lost up in these ways, but I truly feel that one, I want to start educating people about the whole higher ed entity. We know a lot sometimes about how hospitals are ran. We are learning more about how school districts are run. But when we think about higher ed, we think about it from this one lens and we don't understand that we're, there are many countries almost, like it's a many country that is being ran. And so how do we educate and also bring people into understanding that because Going back to your original point about, you know, folks saying like, oh, you have money. We don't need to give you money. It's like, well, 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 let's teach you about like debt management and all of these things. And so I think it's an opportunity, again, going back to reimagining if we're going to move our community, if we're going to move together as one, what are things that we can start educating and using as capital? How are we using our failures as capital to teach and to move? Up in ways, and how are we using what we're doing great to continue doing that too? So, I, if somebody want to hire me to develop, they, uh, you know, support, I am here. My CV, I have it. Feel free. I got a website. Come on in. I can message. Or let me let me throw this to you from a business perspective. So we've talked about before a lot of a lot of companies um, will donate and make big gifts because it's marketing for them. It is either to show, you know, underscore their commitment to diversity uh, and inclusion, or it is to strengthen their own, you know, workforce development and pipeline. Do you think that HBCU should be making more of an effort to reach out to alumni and donors and say, hey, can how can we blow you up? How can we make you more 
noticeable and have the community aware of what you're doing. Because a lot of times people will give to institutions and you never know it. Um, they're doing it anonymously or they specifically say, please don't am- announce this. Uh, there, uh, I forgot to mention this at the top. So Tougaloo College just got a four million dollar gift. Another big gift that no one heard of uh, until now. And it wasn't really covered nationwide. But the two, the, the husband and the wife that gave the money actually gave the first half of the four million dollars months ago. You never heard about it. They just finished the payment this week, but they they've been giving for a while. And these are these are people that have given to UNCF uh, very handsomely. They've given to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. They've been giving this stuff for a minute, but you never attach them to Tougaloo College as like these are some of your this is this is your most prolific I know. donor. I know. I know. So should, should Tougaloo and other HBCUs do more to say, can we please put your name out there so that we can get the we can get the branding from being associated with your your um your gift and your kindness to our institution? I think it should be a there should be a, a relay of information. So when you talk about giving to a university, obviously there is um, there's ways that you can highlight those gifts, but also you have to highlight your alumni. And I think that that motivates the company to do things. So if you have great alumni who are with companies like your Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan Chase, your Citibank, which I know Morgan doesn't know Howard doesn't know, like all these schools do, when you highlight your alumni. Uh, um, those things catch the eye of people's HR departments, people's uh, giving departments, um, community engagement, and you kind of create a cycle where you're highlighting alumni achievements, you're doing that these companies, you engage the companies and the companies give. So I think that that's one area where HBCUs tend to get better at is alumni engagement. And they're not engaged in terms of getting them to give and come back to games and go to galas wearing cheap suits, but but really like cheap engagement suits. from the <laughs> engagement from the engagement from the Perspective saying we've had this person who's left this department, who's left this particular program, and they're doing extremely well with this company. Let's have this company pour back into the university to get more people like this graduate. I was speaking from my alma mater with Morgan. They do a horrendous job of tracking the progress of graduates because I'm a graduate and I've never gotten a phone call, never gotten an email about what I'm doing in my career, um, what people like me are doing in our careers. Um, I mean, I have a friend who's gotten to, got to gotten Wharton with MLT. Nothing. Thing on Morgan's website. So um, I, mean, I think that it's, it's, it's unfortunate because one way that you can in, increase enrollment is to say, look at all these great graduates we have, but you don't, you can't do that if you don't track your graduates. And really it's free. I know, for instance, in the business school of Morgan, there's plenty of secretaries, admins who could create a little Excel document and track where our career go, but we don't, we don't value that. So I think it's less about talking about the companies or even who's giving, but saying, how are we creating the case to entice more giving? How are we putting our school in a position to really show that we're producing really really strong products? You can't just say we're first in the country to produce engineers. Where are those engineers working? What products are the engineers on? What construction have been a part of in Baltimore, in DC, in New York? But you don't have any information. You can tell we we, we can get degrees, but we can't see their true economic impact and the impact it's had on black communities. Because again, when you go from when you go from Polly to Morgan to Turn Whiting, that changed the family. Because you've gone mm-hmm. from an inner city high school to one of the biggest fashion companies in the world. That changes the family. But I bet you Morgan can't give you a number. Well, who well let me ask you this question, because that's an interesting point. And Una, I'll throw this at you. Whose responsibility is it? Because you would think that, OK, most schools do a good job of sending the alumni an email or sending them a letter saying, hey, please update the information. Let us know what you're doing. If you are if you have a success story, email this. If you you know, if, if, if you just change your address uh, tag here. But if the alumni don't update the stuff, then what? So what 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 tips the, what what's the tipping point for alumni to say, I want you to find me? I want you to ask me for money. I want the alumni magazine. Listen, I had, what was that? September 19th, where I gave, I attempted to give to all of, all of the um, HTUs that I attended. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get through to Morgan. I even called my bank saying like, 
is there something wrong with my card? There was something wrong with the site. I tried twice. So first off, have an updated system. Like how can I'm trying to throw money at you and you're not even catching it. Like wow. <laughs> so that's number one. The simple stuff. Two, if you if somebody gives money, you don't have to tell who it is. You could, you could, I mean, if they, if they don't want to be known, it's anonymous. Cool. But let the people know. Everybody got an IG. Put it mm -hmm. on the IG. Let go. Run it. Like all this secret stuff. Like, I don't, I don't get that. Like, just tell the, tell the business. Like, why are we just now finding out? Granted, we're, we're among people who will tell us, right? But that's us. What about other alumni who don't have those, those networks and don't, aren't, aren't running in those circles? Like, I don't understand all this secret stuff. Like. Just give me the link so I can give you my money. Give <laughs> me the link. Clean up the link. Because Babies Hamptons was not... Hamptons University alumni office like has hit a complete 180 post like 2013. And I'm happy for it because it was a struggle in some ways trying to engage beforehand. Um, I am someone where I get overwhelmed quickly. And if I struggle, I'm, I'm, I'm logging off. Like, I don't, I don't like to be overwhelmed with too many process, like with too many, um, I email and y'all like do it here. And I'm like, I sent that yesterday. And they're like, oh, you ain't got, you know, so when I get annoyed, I check out. Some I talk about in therapy, but this ain't my therapy session. But when I get annoyed, you know, I pull out, but a lot I'm done. Of, <laughs> but a lot of, a lot of HBCUs deserve credit because they have improved over the last decade. Um, I know uh, Una got a, a testimony about Morgan Winston. Um, I know has, has come up uh, for a lot of alumni given central. There are a lot of central states. I mean, there are a lot of schools that I've, I've covered that have said we've gotten a lot. We've gotten a lot better at engaging young alumni. A&T, we've gotten a lot better at engaging young alumni. They're, wow. doing, they're, Claflin, they're doing 40 under 40 awards. They're doing all these things that 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 make young alumni pay attention and want to give so that we do got to give them some credit. But Eric, I would ask you, so if, if you looked at Winston, for example, or UDC and said, here's the thing that they do well uh, to really speak to me or speak to people, my classmates and people I, I went to school with to, to get us involved. Here's the thing that they do well. Well, you know, Winston Salem State and UDC, those are they different. Yeah. <laughs> do they do they do they do they do they yeah, Winston said I'm going to give them their credit because, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, the 40 under 40 award every single year is kind of a big deal. I've had a handful of friends who, who are doing things that, I mean, yeah, I, like I talk to them on a regular basis, but even these people who are friends of mine, I, I may not pay attention to what they're doing in their professional realms, but I see what they have going on. Online, they do a really good job. As far as using Instagram, I, I remember distinctly when the Young Alumni Council was started. And the Young Alumni Council, I feel like it was really necessary because, just to be frank, the National Alumni Association really wasn't speaking to the people who were graduating at the time I was graduating. Because, mm -hmm. honestly speaking, we attended vastly different institutions. That's right. Um, and I think that gets lost in translation, too, because, it, you know, when... When a school is progressing, when the school is doing better as it, as it should be doing over time, I mean, shoot, Winston State, the, the building I stayed in in my sophomore year was Wilson Hall. Wilson Hall was built in 1994. Before that, they hadn't really built anything new around there going back to, like, the original freshman life halls. Then 2000 hit, and literally speaking, like, six different halls on the campus were built since then. Yep. The mat, like the amount of students that came out of there, the amount of things that students have done, the amount of people that I know that I remember like random events and parties and being out in the yard randomly with who have PhDs now, we do a good job of celebrating them. I'll give it that. What I've seen at other institutions, however, is with Winston, a lot of us are bigging us up. So we make sure that the school knows. And mm -hmm. I'll give us credit for that. We communicate and make sure that the that people know. What I've seen with other schools and with pages that I've ran with schools that I've worked at, there's a LinkedIn page and you bring in literally everybody who's ever attended your institution. So every single time that they got a job notice that pops up where they change, something change, 
They completed uh-huh. coursework somewhere that pops up and something changed. They they got a new award that they put on their LinkedIn page. It's literally all right there. It's not even that hard to do that work. What can you do with that? You can take that information, put it on an Instagram page where your, where your current students are following. So now not only are you big enough your alumni making them want to donate, but now you have connections that you're creating with the current students there who now can see somebody who went to the same school they went to and could possibly do what they're doing. All of this is like just just working with what's already made available to you that you don't have to really do any work to do because LinkedIn is free. It speaks right? to like it, there's it, certain it, things it, that are just yeah, like free at this yeah, point. A lot of those offices. Because a lot of times you have yeah. people working in yeah, and a lot of people. affairs and all that kind of stuff. And that's tough. Like alumni affairs may have to yeah. be one of those. This is the transition. I mean, the, Go ahead. Yeah, and I, what, I, what I'll say is that, you know, Winston State, they had, they had a guy, I'm not going to say his name, but he's a pretty decent guy. He was working there at Winston. Um, he didn't, I mean, he came from, he worked, he's from an HBCU background. Winston was his first, you know, position, like was one of his first positions as director of, of alumni engagement. And it was, me and him had a real frank conversation. It was really tough. He's no longer working there. He's working at a, at a really nice school here in Maryland. And the experience is much different. And it's so interesting in how easy it is for people that certain PWIs to give to schools that they really don't have a connection to other than their degree. And for us, who we really want that, that relationship, like we, we need more than that. We, people still holding grudges to the school saying, oh, well, I already paid them for my degree. You're like, well, your degree wasn't free. You use it every single day. Deal with it. It's okay. Like, it's not that big of a deal. But just all the little things that we just have to do, we unfortunately have to do. Winston, we'll give you the last word. Um, there is a tipping point for everybody for support. Um, and I've always said, you know, if HBCUs are going to grow, it has to be more than just uh, HBCU graduates. It's going to have to be black people. They're, that That's going to be have to be black America's destination for support. What is the tipping point that you would leave people with to say, even in a pandemic, even with things changing, this is why HBCUs continue to need your support today. I mean, for me, it's it's in the stories that you know. I think KD and and Ors kind of kind of mentioned a little bit. HBCUs change lives, you know. It just for no no uncertain no better way to say it um, changes people's families' trajectories. Um, I've seen it too many times. You know, I think that was kind of what what awakened me to kind of really understand the value having not attended one undergrad myself um, is just seeing what, how it's able to foster and grow a person and change, you know, their family's, you know, trajectory, like I said. And so I think there's just uh, so much inherently valuable in that for a person of color, whether or not you went to one or not, if you're at all um, vested or care about the advancement of us um, collectively, um, you have to invest in these institutions. I think the sororities in this country, shout out to the AKAs and, um, and Deltas and the Zetas and, and other organizations, they have shown, you know, like, like they typically do, shown the way for investing in what's important um, in, our, in this ne- these next generations. And whether or not you went to one or not, there's still inherent value in making sure that young people of color are being educated properly. Um, and we're investing in the resources and ways that are allowing them to be successful. And there's not a there's not a better investment you can make to me and then in the young black person particularly. And, and that's where the majority, a lot of them are educated at these institutions. So we have to understand the value and the professors that are there, the faculty that are there, the young people that are there, the areas in which most of them inhabit that are a lot, largely, a lot of times are inherited by, by black folks in general. We have got to understand um, the value in that. And I think it's also a charge on the institutions themselves and finding ways Again, this thematic thing about reimagining, you know, engaging your alumni in those ways to help them also understand to lead those charges in those communities to people that they know who may or may not have gone to HBCUs or gone to those particular institutions. But we got to find ways to also have them be charged up and engage those folks as well. We, you know, Mission and Claflin having a 40 under 40 and, and other ways. When you go to these parties, alumni parties on campus at homecoming, tell them you got to fill out the form about what you're doing with your life to be able to go to the party. I bet you get some more forms in there. You know, you got to find ways to get to that. You gotta engage them. You gotta charge them. Before, you know what I mean? Foundation. You need to be on the yard after the blue juice. <laughs> 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 
name might be spelled wrong, and the company's name might be spelled wrong, but you need to be on the yard. Grassroots again. You need to be at the parties with the forms, with the little uh iPads, like hey, fill this out, put this in there before you add that that next blue juice should be that, you know, fill this out. All that we gotta find a way to do that. That's the only way we're gonna be able to lead those charges and change and check. We have got to do that. We gotta find ways to do it. Rock H. Obama at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, it, this has been a fantastic conversation. Go judging me for uh, using Obama's name on my um, information. I want to thank each and every one of y'all uh, for a short notice. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you, brothers and sisters. I love you and appreciate you. Uh, no overtime today since Boyd brought up pandemic legend, so that was petty enough. Um, <laughs> but we're going to leave it right there. Uh, but if, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready to go. Back in the dark. <laughs>